So briefly, Amazon Studios, since 2013, um, I think you've had something like 30 original series over those three years. Um, four Emmys, two Golden Globes, a BAFTA, not bad for three years. Um, tell, us, tell us about what's coming up in the fall that you're excited about. I think we're going to see a sneak preview, but if you want to tee that up for us. Yeah, it's been a great start, very exciting. And uh, in the fall, we have Transparent comes back for season three. Uh, Mozart in the Jungle comes back for season three, which they shot in uh, Venice, Italy, and it's incredibly beautiful. Uh, Woody Allen with his first television series, Crisis in Six Scenes. Um, and Man in the High Castle comes back. It's going to be a super exciting fall. We're looking forward to it. I'm excited about all of them, <laughs> and we didn't get to see the Woody show there. But, I was going to uh, say, was the Woody Allen series in there? Uh, no, didn't didn't see a clip there. But you know, we've seen it, and and it's cool. So. So he's uh, directed. He's written and directed every episode. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And how many episodes are there? Six. So it's. And is it a different, <clears throat> different story each week? Or it's uh, well, a... it's sort of a continuous story. Right, yeah. right. So it winds up being kind of like a, you know, like a lot of them, there's, there's a serial story through the season. So series. I read, I think, that you personally went and persuaded Woody Allen to do this by going to the bar where he was playing jazz. Is that story right? Uh, yes, although it was prearranged. It's not like I bumped into him, you know. You didn't stalk uh, him? No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, but there were a few trips to New York and uh, talking about what it would be, and he had never done a TV show, and um, so we're super And how excited. did he find it, do you think? Uh, I, I, you know, I, th I think he said it was like a lot of work. Uh, you know, no yep. surprise. I mean, yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, I think everybody's really excited. And, you know, so it should be a very exciting fall. Uh, you know, Jill Soloway and Woody Allen and, uh, you know, Billy Bob Thornton, you saw there, and Jeremy Tambor coming back. Uh, I think we should probably shoot uh, a lot more seasons in Venice. Uh, <laughs> Did you, is one of my conclusions. Did you, did you manage to get on that trip? Were you? No, sadly. You know, I don't add a lot of value on set. <laughs> so I... Uh, not I, even in Venice. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I did not. I should have, <laughs> but you only live once. So um, those are obviously all shows coming up in the, in the autumn that are already commissioned. Mm -hmm. How far ahead do you look? What, what about 2017? What can we expect for next year? A lot of 2017 is, is scheduled. Um, we just ordered Jack Ryan based on the Tom Clancy novels uh, starring John Krasinski, uh, which, um, you know, so we're, we're planned out fairly well in advance. Um, but still opportunities, still yeah, chances I mean, to get yeah, we have pilots right now that are going, so we Yeah, have... I think we're going to look at some pilot reels. Uh, we're going to look at a pilot sizzle a bit later, but... Yeah, so we have The Tick and uh, I Love Dick from Jill Soloway. Yeah. And um, uh, Jean-Claude Van Johnson, which is hilarious. Uh, it's about Jean-Claude Van Damme, but it turns out his, like, actor job this whole time has been a front for act his actual job where he's a spy and travels around, and it's quite funny. Um, so, you know, last year, this time, at this session, we ran the clips on the pilots, and then everybody voted. Everybody voted in the room, yeah. And they voted for the one that we ordered, so um, yeah. Sneaky Pete. I don't, I don't think we've got that facility this time, but... Um, All right. But just before we look at the pilot sizzle, um, but, but how do you choose... Because not every show you commission um, gets a pilot, does it? Uh, most of them do. The overwhelming majority do. Sometimes it's not possible, but, uh, right. but generally we do pilots. We uh, have the pilots in the US, the UK, Germany, Japan, and we get feedback and it's very helpful. I think it, you know, it allows you to see a show up on its feet, get a sense of uh, you know, what viewers think and get a sense of what critics think. And so it's a helpful part of the process. How long do the pilots stay up? And you About get continuous data, presumably. People yeah. are 
continuously commenting and... It's usually about 30 days. Right. We'll have them up and then we have enough info. And do you ever secretly ignore the data and just go for it anyway? No, but there, there are, you know, there's different kinds of data and, and um, so it's not always just, you know, some people characterize it sometimes as like uh, a vote, but there's no vote and nothing is automatic about it, but people rate like it, the they review the it. Yeah, I mean, you get all the ratings and the reviews, but then you see other things, you know, did people share it on Twitter or Facebook and get a sense, you know, the important thing is, um, do people love the show? You know, in, in today's environment where there are so many TV shows, uh, having a show that, you know, 90% of people think is like pretty fair is not actually that useful because in an on-demand environment, people are probably not going to demand that show. So maybe, you know, 20 years ago, the show would have had more value. You know, you could put it at 9.30 and it'll hold the audience. You can bolster it with shows either. Nine. Yeah, yeah, right. Either uh, side. But these days, I think the value of kind of a mid-level show is substantially reduced from where it was. And the, the value of one of the shows at the top that people are really talking about and they're passionate about, I think that's really where the value is. So you have to interpret the data with that in mind. And do you find that it varies territory to territory, or do you find that there's a sort of consistency? So do they, do they like the same shows in Germany? That Do you get the same kind of responses in Germany that you get in the States? Or do yes, you find except in German. Um, <laughs> you know, but uh, once you translate them, they're okay, quite Okay, and your similar. German, presumably, is yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, it's not that different. There'll be like a little difference here and there, but I think a good show tends to travel. That's what we've observed. Um, but so you put it all together and, and make a decision. I think at the what's, end... What's the success rate? What's the sort of ratio of... That's a good question. What is the actual batting average? I would say the batting average is pretty high. I, can, I could get back to you with the actual data, but I'm going to say it's like 60%. You know, so it's not making, it's not like um, the typical history of pilots in broadcast television in the U.S. I was going to say, it's much, much lower. It's like 10% lower. Yeah. or something like yeah. that. So it's, you know, we, we try not to make a pilot unless we think there's like, there's a good chance, you know, of doing it. Right. And presumably when you commission the pilot, you've commissioned back, you've commissioned scripts behind that as well, so that when you decide it's ready to go. Generally, or at least we've talked about what the show's about. Right. Um, you know where it's going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There should be a Bible or three scripts. Three scripts is a good place to be. Right, right. Um, and, and what about non-scripted? So obviously, we, we've seen a glimpse of the Grand Tour. We're going to be talking about that. And that's a big investment in non-scripted. What about other opportunities in non-scripted? What you, what's your strategy with non-scripted? Yeah, we'll be doing uh, non-scripted kind of on an opportunistic basis, you know, when there's, when there's something great. Uh, I mean, again, the, as, as I said, the, you know, the quest is to get that show that is really a great show that everybody's talking about. And so uh, there's no reason that can't be an unscripted show. And, um, and so we're pursuing those as well. I think you said in the past that, that some of these shows um, that have been successful, that have gone on to, to second and third series, are shows that broadcast television maybe wouldn't have picked up. What, what is the sort of DNA of an Amazon show? What, what, what makes it feel to you like it's an Amazon You know, show? I think the key to standing out in, in such a busy environment is if you're going to do it in a sustained way, is the show has to have a voice that people care about, you know, that, that people love and that is really distinctive. And there's just no way around it. Like, that is the essential ingredient. So, and if you think about, like, what is, you know, what is going to be, you know, the next new thing or whatever, the really zeitgeisty thing, it's, it's not, um, you can't, like, deduce what it's going to be, but I can... I can almost guarantee it's going to be from a visionary creator who's really passionate about doing something new and interesting. And so that's what we tend to focus on. And you know, if something isn't 
uh, you know, slightly controversial or you're a little worried about it or you're a little, there's some of you are a little afraid of it or something, then, you know, maybe it's just sort of boring and passe, you know, maybe it's, you know, just sort of ordinary. And the thing is, the returns on ordinary are rapidly declining. Like, it's got to be unique, it's got to be amazing, it's got to be worth talking about. Uh, you know, you have to have performances and, you know, it has to be like, it has to be true and honest, true to itself. And um, so that's really what you have to look at. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, it's about, it's about talent. Your basically development is very easy. You're just putting together like some sort of fabulous dinner party of sort of television <laughs> geniuses. And if you can put together a terrific party and everybody's on top of their game, then it'll be a great year. I, I, I think when we spoke um, a few weeks ago, you'd, you'd just done a press launch and you said that one of the questions you got asked which really puzzled you was, was a particular script aimed at a particular demographic? And you, you, you're, oh, very, yeah. you're very anti this sort of prescription. That, That's that right. There was, a, there was a question that was like, um, well, I think they asked one of the producers of one of the shows, and somebody asked, well, you know, if you don't know who the demographic is, like, how do you know, like, what to write? And uh, that, well, I, uh, I, you know, I hope nobody on any of our shows is actually thinking about what the demographic is when they decide what to write, because, I mean, you know, if you're going to write something that is really passionate and memorable, and it's going to stand the test of time, I suspect what you're going to be thinking about is that, you know, uh, that moment in your life where that thing happened and you can't forget it and you can't get it out of your system except by writing this amazing script. And, you know, it's more like that. It's not like some deductive process where you have, like, a demo target and, you know, then if you do the math correctly, you know, the script comes out. So, yeah, I found that um, question some combination of confusing and, and sad. And uh, yeah, so we don't do it that way. That's not a good way. But I guess what that question might also have been about is about your data, i.e., you know, what is the demographic of people watching Amazon? Because right. obviously you don't reveal that. So what, what, you know, to what, but you are monitoring that, presumably. You are looking at yeah. the data. And I mean, you do want to know that. And like the marketing department should know that. You know, they should know who they're looking to talk to and reach out to and so on. But, you know, if you're making a show, I think you should be just focus on, focus on making a great show because it's hard enough to make a great show, uh, you know, even if, even if that is your only priority, you know. But if you have 17 priorities, which I think uh, some people do, you know, they, we need a show for Wednesday, we need blah, 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 and you know, this person, political consideration or whatever it is. I think that would be extra challenging, you know, to really, it's like you, you're taking too much into account. So there are all these reasons that might cause you to compromise on a show that, you know, you might be very passionate about and believe in. So to circle back to the original question about, you know, is it, is it like a good sign or a bad sign if a lot of, uh, people have like passed on a show, I think often it's like a fantastic sign. It, or it was, it's like part of the recipe for success because of that, like everybody else in town, you know, thought it was, you know, a horrible idea or too scary or something. Like there are some cases where, you know, they're probably right, but, uh, <laughs> but there are other cases where you can find that thing that it's, it's, it's daunting for people, but there's really something passionate and good there. And that's where you can find a real gem. I mean, Transparent was that way. I think uh, a number of people didn't go in on Transparent. Um, you know, Catastrophe, uh, which is a show here, came to us. We looked at the pilot and, uh, and picked that up. And it's an awesome show now in the fall lineup, and it's nominated for an Emmy. Um, so I, I, we should come to that because I think not many people know with, with both Catastrophe and Fleabag, which are British productions, you were in fact co-producers of that. You came in at the very beginning 
rather than just having them as acquisitions? Yeah, so we're doing a lot of shows uh, that are originated in the UK. And I'd say we're in on, uh, I think, eight of those, and it's only growing. Um, and, you know, so we'll see the material early on. And in the case of Fleabag, uh, you know, Phoebe Waller Bridge is hilarious and, you know, such a great voice, and everybody's going to know who she is. And uh, so we saw that and catastrophe. So, how did that happen? You, you, you were, did the producers, how, how, so for those producers here who think they might have mm -hmm. a project that in development that you, you'd be interested in, did, so with the flea bag example, at what point did you get involved? I think the production company brought us the pilot right. on flea bag. Right. And on catastrophe, um, uh, an agency in LA brought us the pilot uh, and uh, some of them, it'll, we'll get the script. Uh, so, uh, so we're just announcing today that we're doing a, a new show uh, from Neil Gaiman and Fremantle called American Gods, which uh, I think is going to be awesome. It's Ian McShane and Gillian Anderson, very cool cast. And um, uh, so that's, that's another example. I think we saw a script right. and we're very excited. So we got it for the US, UK, Germany, and Japan. And, uh, and so now we're super busy here. And in fact, our, uh, we're going to build a team, grow a team in London. So we have a position open for uh, head of original content like outside of the US, not, not counting the US. Um, and you know, so we're looking to double down and have some people in London. Great. So, so far, we've been doing it just yeah, by like, so visiting. Yeah, so people have been pitching to, to LA, but you're going yeah. to build the commissioning side in, yeah. the, in London. Yep. Um, we're going to go to questions. Um, I, in fact, a question has come up on the app, um, which was relevant to what we were talking about. So how does Amazon judge a show's success, given that? Once it's on the air. But you look at the data, presumably. You yeah. do look at the... Yeah, I think, you know, uh, are, people, are a lot of people watching it? Uh, are they talking about... Do you, do you reveal it? the data to the producers? Uh, not really. Just, you know, we might characterize it in a really high-level sort of yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Um, uh, but, you know, it, are, are people watching the show? Are people talking about the show? Does it seem to influence their decision to, you know, uh, join Prime or stay with Prime? You know, is it getting a lot of critical buzz? Those are all factors. Uh, so here's a question. How many people need to watch Top Gear? Well, not Top Gear. The Grand Tour, I presume, is what they mean. Uh, to make it worth Amazon's money? Seven. Uh, seven. <laughs> I was going to say that. Yeah, definitely seven. Uh, yeah. So tell us, so the Grand Tour is going to be on when in the autumn? In autumn. <laughs> so uh, there's September. Will it be on in September? Let me clarify. It's going to be on in the fall. <laughs> Will it be sort of late fall, middle fall? I'm, I'm not sure when. Is it, when is it coming? No, it, it's sometime in I'll the autumn. I'll try again with Andy. When does autumn end? Is that like December 22nd or something? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, and, and is the Grand Tour going to be broadcast weekly? Or is it? are we going to get everything at once? You know, I'm not sure that we're uh, saying more about the Grand Tour distribution pattern at this point. But, uh, you know, I can say it will be very exciting and fun. <laughs> and however it comes out, it will be fabulous and you'll love it. So here's a very, this has clearly come from producers in the room. What is the highest unit price you've paid for a factual project? <laughs> and how does Amazon recoup the cost? Uh, well, you know, I would say that without specifying the budget, uh, the budget to date has not been, I think, a limiter on any of our shows in terms of getting... Because Netflix, you know, I think... Uh, producers may correct me in the room, started off with a relatively high tariff for factual, but have recently lowered it. Um, but you don't, you don't sort of work in terms of tariffs? 
Well, I think we'd have to figure out like how much does it cost to make a great show, you know? And so we'll so just you look start at each there. Project. And then yeah. That's how much it would cost. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question in the old-fashioned way, do put up your hands. Um, uh, yes, so it, it's, you look at each project as it comes. When, right. What's your timetable on getting your team in London? When do you think that might all come to? I think that will happen soon. I mean, the, the opening is up now, so I think over the next you know, month or five weeks, typically. Good. It usually goes fast. Um, any other questions? Yes, Kenton. Is it Kenton? Go on. <laughs> you're, you're, you're very brown. You're blending into the blackness. I think that's a good question, and it'll be interesting to look at the cadence. We have a lot of shows in the fall uh, slash autumn. Um, and I, I think we have to learn from customers to start getting a sense of, you know, is there a point where it's, it's too much or, you know, like one a month could work, but maybe, maybe it could be a little more than that. Um, and uh, so I, I think we don't have religion on that at this point, and it'll be worth doing some different experiments and seeing how people respond to different cadences. Yes. Ah, there is a mic. How much of your decisions are linked to Amazon sort of retail in Seattle or Mothership, and how much are autonomous within Amazon Studios? <coughs> well, there, there are no real like retail considerations such as, you know, I think this show would you know, do an amazing job promoting, you know, shoes or something like that. So, the, you know, it's really the only question is, is this, could this be an awesome show that people would love? And if so, then it, then it completely fits in with, you know, what uh, will work for Prime Video. Roy, thank you very much. <laughs>